22 through 25. I'm going to get rid of my keys. They're bugging me. Luke 8, 22 through 25. And it says this. Now it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples, and he came and said to them, Let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. But as they, as they sailed, Jesus fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water. And the windstorm came down on that lake, and they were filling with water, and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Then he crossed and rebuked, uh, he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased, and there was a calm. But he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, Who can this be? For he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. First thing I want to draw your attention to is it says, And he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Say that with me. Say, Let us cross over to the other side. See, there are places that God wants us to be in our lives. There are places and things that he wants us to go and to do. And he says to his disciples, all right, let's go on an adventure together. Let's go on a journey together. And when they got over to the other side, by the way, they were greeted by something called legion, which was thousands of demons in the sky, all right? So they were on their way to a mission trip or so, right? And he says, let us cross over to the other side. You know, two things here. Number one, do you realize that God wants you to grow and be healthy in every area of your life? And do you realize that God wants to use you to reach out to others for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because God wants the world, amen, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, he wants the world to have what they desperately need, even though they don't need it, Jesus. Amen? You know, so, you know, you know, God wants what's best for you and your marriage. He wants your marriage to be healthy. So he may be saying to you, okay, listen, it's time to cross over it's time to work on that part of your life. You know, he may have a ministry or he wants something to do or there's something that he's working on. How many guys know that God is always working on something in our lives? And he keeps saying, let's cross over. Let's cross over. Follow me. Let's go on this journey. It's going to be good. Amen? But in order to cross over, we have to be willing to step out in faith. And I love the words that it says, and they launched out. All right? No, from the very beginning, I've always not liked being out in the middle of a lake. You know, my dad used to take us out just a little ways, maybe 10 feet from the lake. He'd rock that boat, and us kids would be like, oh, no, we're dying, you know. The rest of the kids were faking it, but I was serious. Was, Don't rock the boat. You know, it's like my sister, who was very adventurous. We went to that place out in the Adirondacks, a big water park there, something safari. Enchanted for us, yeah. And my sister says, I hated the rides, and my sister says, hey, do you want to go on the Ferris wheel with me? Well, I'm thinking the Ferris wheel is innocent. What, what can happen on a Ferris wheel, all right? Well, the, a lot can happen on a Ferris wheel, especially when you're with your sister who loves to rock the boat. And we're at the very top, and she's like, whoa, watch this, watch this. And I'm looking down, and my life is flashing before me at about, you know, 12 years old, and she's only 10, but she still loves rocking it, you know. You know, sometimes when you launch out, right, to do the thing that God has called you to do, it kind of feels like, whoa, whoa, right? And what you need to understand is that this place that they were going was called the Sea of Galilee. And what's interesting about the Sea of Galilee is it's not really an ocean. It's a fresh water. It's fresh water. And it's really quite small, right? But what's interesting, and I'm going to read this uh, to you because I did some research on the Sea of Galilee. This is interesting. Storms on the uh, Sea of Galilee result from differences in temperatures between the sea coast and the mountain beyond. The Sea of Galilee, li uh, Galilee lies 680 feet, ready for this, below sea level. It is bounded and surrounded by hills, especially on the east side where they reach 2,000 feet high. These heights are the source of cool and dry air in contrast directly around the sea. The climate, climate is semi-tropical with warm air and moist air. The large differences in the height between the surrounding land and the sea cause large temperature and pressure changes. This results in strong winds dropping to the sea, funneling through hills and large storms. So literally on the Sea of Galilee, you can be looking at sunshine, and literally two minutes later, a storm is hit. Um, I didn't show it for you yet. I'm going to show it next week. I didn't quite get it done. But I actually went to YouTube, and people have actually filmed this calmness on the Sea of Galilee today, and the storm just hitting it. 
And, and I saw boats out there, and it's calm. I mean, it's like calm like Oneida Lake, not a, not a wave, just peaceful and calm. And then you hear a wind, and then bam, and the ship is going all over the place, you know? The Sea of Galilee, I think, reminds me a lot of what life can be like. One minute it can be calm, things can be cool, and things can be collected, and the next minute the wind hits and you're like this. Am I alone? Has everybody ever out there felt like this? Have you ever had a season in your life when things are just fine and then bam, the storm hits? Amen? Well, that's what they were dealing with. And, you know, the storm is there to distract us from going to the other side. How many of you guys know it's very easy to get distracted by a storm in your life? God has been speaking to you about some things that he wants you to do. He's trying to help you to grow. He wants to encourage you to be in a different place uh, to next year that you were the year before, and in comes the storm. And all of a sudden, we forget about where we're going because we are so concerned and scared about where we are. Amen? You know, the storm is also there to test our faith. I believe Jesus was testing our faith. And, you know, I can't prove it. And it, because he was probably sleeping because that's what the Bible says. But what if Jesus was just laying there going, well, let's see what they do. It's, it's not in the Bible, but I'm just, you know, <laughs> just wondering, you know what I'm saying? Because he's asleep on the stern. Do you know people in your life that maybe get on your nerves because when the storm hits, they fall asleep? When I was a child, my grandmother, I was scared of thunderstorms. And my grandmother tried all the same things that maybe you've heard of. God is bowling. But God is not bowling, Grandma. I am 10 years old. <laughs> you know? Oh, he's moving his furniture around. Oh, come on, Grandma. Me and you both know God doesn't have furniture. Well, whatever. I don't know. And so what she would do was she would, she would say, you know what? Why don't, why don't you go and lay down and I'll read your story or something. To this day, and every time a thunderstorm would hit during the day when we were that young and we were home, Grandma would say, let's go read a story and just relax. To this day, the sound of thunderstorms puts me to sleep. I just think it's so, like, peaceful. You know, I'm not like that necessarily with the storms of my life, although I wish I was. But do you have people in your life that you know that when the storm hits, they're like, eh, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. Jesus, we're perishing. We're dying. The water is coming into the boat. Wake up. Amen? But Jesus has this peace that is there. And he asks them a really cool question because I don't think God asks questions or Jesus asks questions for no reason at all. He says this, where is your faith? Well, that's interesting. Because, you know, if, if, I, if um, Nate was getting ready to play drums and I said, Nate, where are your drumsticks? He has drumsticks. It's just, where are they? They're in the closet, right? right? And I broke somebody's drumsticks on Friday. I'll, I'll get, I got a couple pair upstairs. Okay, anyway, uh, it's this. Okay, so <laughs> focus. So anyway, it's not like he doesn't have drumsticks. It's like, okay, I don't have drumsticks, so let's go look for them. Has anybody ever looked for something you don't have? I hope not, because you're, if you don't have it, there's nothing to look for, right? If you're looking for your keys, it's because you had your keys and you misplaced them. If you're looking for your phone, it's because you've misplaced your phone and you're looking for it. If you're looking for your Bluetooth, it's because you have it and it's been misplaced. So what Jesus is saying is this. You have faith. The question is, where is it? Is it in the storm that you're dying and perishing? Or is your faith in me that says we're going to cross over? When we go through the storms of life, I want to encourage you to look and stay focused on where your faith is. Is your faith in Jesus and what he's doing in your life, or is your faith in your circumstances that, is, that are happening in your life? If, in the disciples, they had faith. The question was, Jesus was, was, where is it? If they really knew who Jesus was, they would have not believed they were going to die. They would have believed they would live. Even after this miracle happens, the, the, with this question, this is what they said. This is their question back to Jesus. Who could this be? They asked that question. Who could this be that even the wind and waves obey him? To know Jesus is to know how much he loves you and what he is capable of doing in your life. Amen? If I told you, okay, um, 
I don't know. I got to pick a name. Something simple. I'm going to use the word Mike. It's not you, Mike. I'm just using the word Mike. Okay? So this guy Mike comes in the building, and they say, this guy has a reputation for being a serial killer. And I'm not talking about Kellogg's. A serial killer, right? Now, would you guys be like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to invite Mike over to my house. Let's have a small group together. No, he's a serial killer. The dude's crazy. What he is capable of is nuts. Would you put your trust in that kind of guy? No. But what if I told you that, um, uh, God, I think of something on the fly. Give me something. Lord. What if I told you that there was somebody that was coming in that had experienced a lot of miracles in their life, and they, they, had, they had moved in the gift of healing, and that many people that had died had been risen again through this person's ministry and God moving through them, right? And would you trust to maybe sit down and listen to him if he had that kind of reputation? Probably would, right? Okay. So you know what Jesus' reputation is, right? And our question is, are we willing to put our trust in that? And there was a song last week, and a couple members mentioned this to me, that something that hit them last week was in the song that you guys sang, that the wind and waves knew his name. And it got me thinking. The wind and the waves knew what he was capable of. The wind and the waves knew his, his name. Turn and click with me really quickly to Luke chapter 8, verse 28. You should be right there because we're whatever. And this is the story of Legion, this demon. This is what they, after God crossed, after they crossed over with Jesus, they had some work to do over there, right? Okay? And they run into this demon-possessed guy that actually has a lot of demons in him, right? He comes out with the name Legion, and this is what the demon says. Notice, Jesus hasn't revealed himself to this demon. He doesn't say, like, okay, listen, I'm Jesus, the Son of God, and you're going to listen to me. He doesn't do that. He just approaches him, and as he approaches him, it says this. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. The demon knew who Jesus was. He knew that he was the Son of the Most High God. Jesus had introduced himself, but he knew. How about Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4? One of my favorite scriptures on healing. Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. The healing of the leper. Leprosy had only been healed once in the history of the church, once. That's it. No other time had leprosy ever been healed. And so Jesus, and we've talked about this before, I'm not going to get into it, but Jesus does some things that are against the rules. He touches the leper. Hello, Jesus, don't touch the leper. You're going to get leprosy. He approaches the leper. You're supposed to stay a certain distance away from him. But Jesus wasn't afraid of leprosy because leprosy knew his name. Because in Luke 8, 28, or Luke, uh, Matthew 8, 1 through 4, it says this. When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus put his hand on him touched him saying, I am willing, be cleansed, and immediately. I've heard that a lot in the last few weeks. Somebody say immediately. When Jesus touched him, something happened. Amen? Immediately, the Bible says, the leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priests, and the gift of Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So he says, this guy is healed of leprosy, sends him out, to do what the law says to do with the, with the, uh, at the time and to prove to them that this actually happened. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Somebody say this would be. The leprosy knew his name. So the wind and the waves knew his name. Sickness and disease knew his name. Leprosy knew his name. Amen. Demons knew his name. And at one point in Matthew 16, 16, Jesus says to his disciples, who do, you, do they say I am? Who does everyone say I am? Well, it's easy because you can speak for somebody else. It's not like you're talking about what you believe. It's about what the people around you believe. But then Jesus takes it deeper. Who do you say I am? And Peter rises up and he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter knew 
who Jesus was. My question to you is this as we end. Do you know his name? Do you personally, individually, one-on-one, -on -one, do you know his name? Do you know how much he loves you? Do you know what he is capable of doing in your life? And are you willing to cross over, where's your faith? Do you believe? Do you believe? And we spend a lot of time, like, I've always been a kid that loves to imagine. I like imagination. I had a huge imagination when I was a kid. Okay, I was the kid that had a friend that was an imagination guy. Okay, so I don't remember his name, but I had I talked to him. I haven't in probably three weeks now. We've been doing better, me and my therapist. But no, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> He's no, I no longer have an American friend. It's okay. We go, oh my gosh, we got a psychopath preaching in our church. <laughs> it's time for Pastor Dennis to take over. <laughs> but anyway, uh, where was I? He's like, believe me, I'm, I'm not going to say that. Just stop, Jeff, stop. You know, focus. And I'll never forget in the fourth grade, we were, I was in fourth grade, there was this teacher, and she was great. Her name was Mrs. McCullough, and I just got done with a teacher that was, like, not good at all. She, she would, like, when I would struggle with my homework, she would stand next to me, and she had, she was, like, 70-some years old, and she had, like, these long nails, and she didn't clean them. And she, she would be, like, right onto my desk. Now, do you know what that does to a hyperactive a kid? It is awful. It is awful because you can't, you can't pay attention to your work. It's the hands and the dirt and the nails. It can't get whatever. She drew me. I, could, I did horrible. Yeah, Jordan, we could connect. And, you know, but, but the next year I had this wonderful teacher who her name was Mrs. McKellar, and she, she really was soft-hearted. She was tender. She was gentle. She was kind. But she also knew how to get my work done. And um, so we had parent-teacher conference. I was struggling as normal. And she said, you know, the problem with Jeff is that we have a classroom. The playground is right out there. And I watch him look at me and then drift away. <laughs> so it happens here. I'm up in my office. I'm studying. Things are going great. And I go down the stairs into the thrift store and start handing out food. But anyway, you know, and it just, my imagination. But you know what? What happens when you start imagining things or putting images in your head of negative things? Amen. What happens? Where is our faith? Exactly. That's where our faith is. But, you know, I love to read the Gospels because I can see Jesus. I can see this leper coming to Jesus. I can see the fear in his eyes that I'm not supposed to be in, in public, that this is not a good thing. And I can see Jesus touch him. Wow. And when I see that, I think... If Jesus can heal a man of leprosy, Jesus can deal with me. Where is our faith? What kinds of images are you putting in your head? Because you can be scrolling through Facebook and things can be great, and all of a sudden there's something put there, and your, your head just goes right out the door. Amen? Where is your faith? If you think, well, I'm a Christian, and because I'm a Christian, storms just won't come. Well, a couple things here. You're crazy. Number two, um, uh, the denial is not just a river in Egypt. Um, the elevator might not go to the top. And um, all that stuff. Because that's craziness. How many guys know, when, when, hold me here and be careful because we're going to set up some, some counseling things, deep counseling. You're going to meet with me three or four times a week for five or six hours a day. Uh, <laughs> believe that when you got saved, right, that everything was going to be perfect, and you, and you experienced that. that. Since you got saved, nothing's ever happened to you. No way, because you know what? you got a bullseye on your back right now. Church on the Rock has a bullseye on its back, and I love it. The devil wants to, to stop things from happening here because people are getting saved. Amen? Just because you're saved, it doesn't mean the storms won't happen in your life. In fact, we're, we have much in common together because storms have happened. You can expect it. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. But know that when you're in the storm, that there is somebody with you who is very powerful, who is all-powerful, who is stronger than the wind and the waves, 
who has power over sickness and disease, who knows who you are because he created you. He is with you, and if he is for you, Who could be against you? What storm can come? What demonic power can try? What sickness can take me out? What thing or circumstance in my life can overthrow Jesus? No one, nothing, nowhere. You are more than you know you are because Jesus is in you. God is for you in the storm. So when the storms come, you can stand up to that storm and say, in the name of Jesus, In the mighty and awesome name of Jesus. Sickness, you've got to go. In the name of Jesus. Poverty, you've got to go. In the name of Jesus. This circumstance that is happening to me in my life that is not in accordance to the word of God, you can't stay here. (sighs) Breathe. (laughs) You know, I'll share one quick story with you. And I wish that I could tell you that I hit a home run every time a storm hit in my life, but I have not. I have in my life forgotten how powerful Jesus really is. I have looked at the disciples in the Gospels and said, Peter, how could you possibly tell Jesus he's not going to the cross? How many times did Jesus say to the disciples, where's your faith? That you live in doubt and unbelief. How could you do that? You walked with the Son of God. Easy. I walked with the Son of God. And sometimes I don't know his name. But one time that I was ready, (laughs) kind of, I had worked, we had worked really hard. I had been wanting some transportation to the church, you know. So I was believing God for some wheels, right. It was, so we were saving up for a, um, a truck, okay. And we were getting really close. I was ready to go and buy this truck. And there's this windstorm that comes. And we didn't really notice. We thought maybe there was some minor damage on the roof. But when the neighbor across the street says, back up here, we could see that a quarter, a half, the roof was folded in half on the top. And I'm thinking, how could this happen? And then, th- and then so we went up there, and Amy's very great on height. She's jumping all over the place and just fooling around. I'm up there like, I'm going to, I feel like I'm going to die, okay, because I just don't do well with heights. I'm up there, and I'm thinking, you know, and I thought to myself, devil, who do you think you are? Me and Amy have given when it hurts. We're doing our best to budget. I've been walking to work for, an, uh, for about a year now, two years now, details, sorry, <laughs> two years now. What, who do you think you are? And so, It's not going to happen. This roof is going to get fixed, and we're not paying for it. On the inside, I'm thinking, we're not paying for this, right? So we get the insurance thing to say that we'll pay for it, which is great. But then we were going to hire some people to do it, and this one person that um, we were looking at maybe doing it happened to be a youth pastor. And I thought, oh, let's stick this in the devil's eye. Not only is the roof going to get fixed, but I'm going to bless, we're going to bless the youth pastor who's in the ministry with some money to fix the roof. And then he called me and he said, Jeff, listen, um, I got a friend who doesn't know Jesus. I was wondering if maybe he could work on the roof with me and I could talk to him about Jesus. <laughs> oh, this is going to be great. Let's stick it in the devil's eye one more time. Let's hope and pray that somebody gets saved on my roof. You send a storm my way and somebody's going to get saved on my roof. He didn't get saved, but he got ministered to. Well, you know, and... Sometimes I haven't done that. Sometimes I thought, oh, my gosh, oh, no. And my focus has been on the storm instead of on Jesus. I want to encourage you to keep your eyes on Jesus. How big is the mountain? How big is your faith in God? How big is the storm? How big is your faith in God? I want you to ask yourself, where is my faith Is my faith in Jesus, or is my faith in the storm? Can you all stand up with me? Hallelujah. And I just want to pray for you, and if you could play some worship music, Pastor Val, that'd be great. Awesome. Absolutely. Hello, check, check, check. Hello, hello.